the recording uh, has started. Okay, here we go. All right, so uh, Cyprus Computer History Museum. My name is Alexandros Kofteros, the curator and co-founder of the museum. We are very, very honored to have today with us Mr. David Fox, one of the people who really created the industry. Uh, what can we say about David Fox? First of all, thank you. Thank you for being here. This is a huge honor for us, Mr. Fox. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> um, now, uh, from what I understand is that you're a pioneer not only video game development, but also you kickstarted one of the very first computer clubs uh, back in the mid 1970s. Is that correct? Yeah, um, in 1977, we launched the Marine Computer Center. You can see I'm in that picture. That's me in the upper right corner mm -hmm. with the mustache, which was which was actually brown back then. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> and uh, my wife and I did it. And we got a loan for um, 10 computers, and most nine of them were these processor technology SOL 20s. And we were a nonprofit, um, so people could make donations. And we were able to rent a, a very nice library from a school that had closed down. It was actually a rel relatively new school, so um, we had a great space. and. We had kids would come in for birthday parties and field trips with schools, and we taught programming to both kids and to adults, and um, ran it for about, we ran it for about four years. It continued for another maybe three or five years after that. So from 1977 till maybe 87, it was, was there. And by then, it, its use was not as important because people were starting to buy computers. So when at the time we first opened, no one had personal computers yet. Um, and for when we did field trips, most of the time, my wife, Annie, who was mostly running them, would ask the kids or the adults if they'd ever seen a computer before and the let alone touch one, and none of them had. Mm -hmm. So this is really brand new for the, for the era. Um, and of course, apart from that, you also authored uh, some books on um, um, programming and one of the first animation books. Of course, back then, it's not about animation, using tools to create animation, but it's uh, the whole theory behind how you create animations, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, well, we split the book into two parts and the first half or first part was looking at computer state of the art computer animation at the time, um, which was like early eighties. And the second part was how to do animation with your Atari 800 computer and, you know, giving a bunch of programs and trying things with, you know, color cycling and player missile graphics and vertical blank switching and, and all that. And, um, it was a um, pretty big book and we were able to use the corners of the pages as a flip book. So when you flip through the pages, you'll see an animation happening like, like one of those little paper flip books. So I think we had maybe going both ways in the upper right, cor upper, upper corners, I think is how we did it. Right. And, um, that was really fun. That was that was actually how I connected with people at Lucasfilm was that um, they were um, the newly, relatively newly created computer division was also in the same county where our computer center was in Marin County. And I was able to get a visit with them, get a tour and got to meet several of the people and hang out with them. And uh, one of the guys who started the the computer division, Alvy Ray, Alvy Ray Smith, offered to proofread my computer book once it was done. And around the same time I finished the book, I had my manuscript completed, was when I first heard about the games group being started from um, 
one of our computer center members who worked at Industrial Light and Magic. So I already had the connections. I was able to make the phone call and call them up and ask if I could get interviewed. And um, my book is a resume, essentially, because it showed I knew the Atari 800. Coincidentally, the, uh, the initial funding for this computer games group came from Atari. Yeah. So we actually had to use the Atari 800 for our games. So everything was just like lined up perfectly. It was like, I, like someone had traveled back in time and said, hey, if you want to work at Lucasfilm, here's what you need to do. First, start this computer center in Marin County, um, learn about games, write a book on computer animation, um, and, and then be ready. <laughs> so the, the star aligned, and, and of course, um, the, the people you met there are the people who also revolutionized um, computer graphics. Ari Ray Smith, if I'm correct, is one of the founders of Pixar, right? Right. So the the you know the computer divi the computer division um, after a few years ended up being purchased by Steve Jobs and became yeah. Pixar. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> all the people that I knew really well ended up going to Pixar. So you you really really trailblazing and creating the the, the core you're the, the people who actually create the core. And talking about the core, you were one of the founding members of Lucasfilm Games, if I'm correct. Yeah, I mean, people start using those words. I never thought of it while I was there. I just considered myself to be an early employee because it wasn't my idea. Right. Um, so I, I feel like, I guess, George Lucas is the founding member since it was his idea to start a games group, probably. Um, but it, I was one of the first employees to be hired. So Peter Langston was our manager. He was the first person. He's who I interviewed with. Then a guy named Rob Poor transferred from the computer division where he was doing laser uh, laser film printing, um, working in that group. And then he said he wanted to come over to do games. And then I got hired. So I guess I'm the third person um, to bring to be coming in. This is still very impressive. And one of the first games you directed was, of course, a very challenging game. Uh, was Rescue on Fractalus. And one of the games I inherited with my uh, Atari 65XC. Uh, this was back in 1985, and uh, it was still very groundbreaking for the time it was released with uh, Fractal several 3D graphics and the first person view um, and all that. I mean, the young people today cannot realize what a groundbreaking game this was back in 1985, but it was a groundbreaking game. Um, may I ask, what were the, the, the technical challenges in creating this amazing game? Well, one of the, going back a bit again, when I first met people at the computer division, one of the people I got to know was a guy named Lauren Carpenter, who was famous, I guess, not yet, but he would become famous for having first figured out how to do fractal landscapes in computer animation, where you could fly through landscapes. And he had done an early film called Vol Libre before he joined Lucas. That was probably what got him the job. And then he was instrumental in the Genesis effect for Star Trek to Wrath of Khan, where you're, we have this terraforming of a, of a moon or a planet. And then you have a scene where you're flying through these rocks or these mountains. So um, we, we hung out at computer, the computer graphics conference, SIGGRAPH, that first year that I met him. And then when I joined, our the games group's offices weren't quite ready yet. So I ended up moving into his office. So we became office mates. And one of the first things I remember asking him was, is it possible, do you think, to be able to do a fractal landscape game on an Atari 800, on an Atari computer? And his first reaction was, yeah, no, no, no way. Because mm -hmm. he knew very well what, 
how intricate it was. Then he, I think he thought about it for a while and he said, well, you know, maybe there is a way to do it. He ended up borrowing one of our Atari 800s, took it home, got the manuals and came back literally in a few days with a working demo of um, a landscape that you could fly. You could, it wasn't really flying. It was like really moving around in because there were no flight dynamics yet. It was just, so it was just a, a proof of concept that you could actually get a decent frame rate. I think he was getting, because nothing else was happening, maybe seven or eight frames per second, which was unheard of for, for, for that time. Yeah. Um, the, the video you're showing there, it looks like it's probably around maybe five or six. Um, and that's enough to, you know, give you the, the feeling like it's actually, um, you're actually moving through it. I think the flight simulators at the time were all done with line drawings and maybe three or four frames per second. And so this was revolution just, just for that. And the fact that you're actually moving through and, and shooting and, and flying and landing and all the things you got to do in the game. So huge hurdle was to get it to work. Um, that's Lauren. Um, next big one was to actually make it feel like you're flying through this landscape. And that was Charlie Kellner, who was an early employee, I think maybe employee number seven at Apple Computers, came over and joined our team. And he did all the flight dynamics. He did the cell animation routines. He did... Um, I think he did all the sound routines. He did like a lot of the heavy lifting to get it to work um, using Lauren's code and improving upon Lauren's code because he knew he knew the 6502 really, really well on mm -hmm. um, the processor. Yeah, so he knew how to optimize things for it. Um, and then the other was space because we, you know, this is a, um, I think we had to get it to fit into 16K of, of, of RAM. Um, and that was difficult. I think originally it was going to be a 5200 um, cartridge game, and then we decided to also do it on the computer. So it was actually ready to go um, earlier. Um, it was actually shown at the Consumer Electronics Show in 1984. Um, and I think Atari released the 5200 version and maybe the 800 version on cartridge around that time. Um, but then that's also right after the Consumer Electronics Show, CES, is when Atari got bought by Jack Tramiel. Yeah. And all the contracts were up for grabs. And and I guess we didn't like the new terms. So we ended up pulling the game for release and ended up going with a different publisher, which took like another year to get a disc, a disc version ready to go. And load routines and copy protection and um, packaging and all that stuff. So that's why it came out like, I guess, 85. But it was really, I mean, most people at the time first saw the game in 1983 when a pirated version uh, of both Rescue and, Ball, and Ball Blazer were released to all the, the BBSs and anyone who wanted to, all the Atari Hobbyist clubs were able to download free versions of them, which were pretty close to final. I mean, there were some tweaks and fixes we did, but they were like 95% of what we did for the final games. Just devastating when we found that out that it happened. Um, it kind of took the, took the excitement out of the actual release. It's, uh, it's, it's a shame how it ended because this is a huge game that... Um, I, I I don't think that anything that was in the market came even close for at least another three or four years after this. So it was way ahead of its time. Yeah. I wanted to say that I, the inspiration for the game was a combination of Star Raiders, um, yeah. which we which was our premier game that we use at the computer center. Um, we have it set up on a, a large projection screen and with really good sound system and that's that was the the first choice for 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 most kids to play that game so the first it was like the first person rush and also star wars mm -hmm. you know being able to you know the first person scenes through the um through the trenches and I'm feeling like i want to get that adrenaline rush of flying a first person experience and um 
I had actually intended it to be a Star Wars game when I first came up with the idea. And very soon, like within the first day or two, found out that I was working there at Lucasfilm that we actually couldn't couldn't do Star Wars games um, because all the rights to all the Star Wars licenses for computer games and you know any kind of uh, game was already sold. So it was they're all tied up. So we had to do something original. All right. Um, and then the whole, of course, um, I don't want to elaborate more on this, even though each, every game that you created, we could devote an entire interview on every single game. So I'll just skip ahead and I would love to have you uh, discussing each game individually in other interviews. Uh, but uh, let's skip to your first graphic adventure. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the first graphic adventure released. Oh, sorry, uh, released by uh, Lucasfilm, based on a film this time, the, the Labyrinth with David Bowie, and I love that. And uh, this is this is some something actually that you pushed the graphic adventure genre. Um, Sierra created the genre, but they still relied on um, a text-based parser to give commands to Graham. Uh, but here you have the precursor uh, with your um, wheel system to what's going to be um, the, the rest of the adventures, which was brilliant. I mean, the, uh, the way we can use this click wheel you created in order to control the character. And right. This, yeah. Well, well, part of it uh, was, because we knew, we knew about Sierra games, obviously, and we knew about their text parser, and we had a big internal discussion, like, could we actually do a text parser? And we had a really tight deadline because we wanted to get the game done around the time the movie came out. We missed that by a few months, but you know, we, we didn't have time to actually do a really good text parser, and even a bad text parser um, would be would would just be terrible. Even a good one isn't that great. Often, you know, it misses a bunch of stuff. So the idea of of pre choosing all the verbs came out of our brainstorming sessions. And um, I think I think it was my idea. Um, the idea of picturing it as like a slot machine interface is what I referred to it as. But a bunch of us went to London for a week and brainstormed with Douglas Adams of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fame. And he was friends with Jim Henson, who was the director of the film. And he, we spent a week in a room going up with ideas and how we could actually adapt the movie into an adventure game and do it in a way where it felt like you were in the same universe, but you having seen the movie wouldn't give you a big advantage in, in winning the game. I think we had to assume that you hadn't seen the movie and we still would still have fun. So um, you hear my dog barking in the downstairs. Um, we ended up um, choosing this to make it easier to implement, but also realizing that it gave us a big advantage in terms of um, knowing what the intent was the player had and limiting the number of options in a way which make it actually implementable but still fun so that worked but, um, this is uh, though the um, if I the, some of the things that I like and I see that labyrinth obviously um, was inspiration on which you build for the following games for example the sprites are larger uh, more cartoony and this is something, of course, we've seen in the next um, graphic adventures from Lucasfilm. And to the people who are going to watch this, Labyrinth is the first graphic adventure, anime graphic adventure from LucasArts. And it's the first animated graphic adventure that was created without a command line, <laughs> entirely with uh, uh, selections. And of course, this is going to lead to Maniac Mansion and the Scum Engine. <laughs> yeah, so so it's interesting. The the team 
for Labyrinth, um, the technical, the chief technical guy was Charlie Kellner again, the person who worked with me on Rescue and Fractalus. And he, I think he used his cell animation routines from Rescue and added scaling. So you actually had scaling characters. So when they walked away, you actually see them scale down, which kind of worked. It, you know, not great because the resolution wasn't really there to do it properly, but it kind of worked. Um, also, you saw there's you know, smooth scrolling, slide, slide scrolling of screens. Um, that was something that was new. And um, some of that stuff worked, you know, came into Maniac Mansion, but I think to be honest, I don't believe that Ron Gilbert, who was the lead on that game, actually saw Labyrinth as the inspiration for the verb interface. I think he kind of maybe it, maybe because I mean he had the same problems with text parsers that that we did that they just weren't. The game became guess the parser, guess guess what it is the intent the programmer intended you to come up with for the selection of words for the objects you're supposed to deal with. Um, and this just seemed a lot better. So he, so I, I think it, he probably, I mean, clearly he must've seen it, but I think he kind of went off in a different direction where you just chose stuff with the mouse. So it's much more point and click based than ours was. Um, and Ron had just, Finish working on the Scum engine, script creation utility for Maniac Mansion, and asked me if I'd be interested in being the first Scum programmer and actually wire up the game. And so I did a lot of it. Um, he he did. He also did it. This is the first game we did that had cutscenes. That was a major innovation. So you actually cut away to a different part of the environment and see something play out. Um, kind of for backstory that was a huge thing that showed up in pretty much all games after this and um the idea of having um you know, switching characters the you know, multiple characters you could choose um that was um that also made the game extremely difficult to implement that you could in the beginning you could choose from a, an array of different characters, two out of the group of characters be to accompany Dave, made the game geometrically more difficult to to debug and program and, and get completed. Because um, every combination would have to be um, a possible to succeed. So um, hard game. I think, it, I think I was on it for about six months. Then I moved on to to Zach and Ron had to finish this game. But I was I was locked in that in that mansion for at least six months trying to trying to get the game to to get the game finished. Um, since we mentioned Jack going there, but first this is my maniac mansion, my copy of maniac right. mansion. Right. Uh, now we're going to move to Jack. Jack McCraggan. I mean, what can we say about this game? What can we say about this game? To me, this is the most humorous graphic adventure ever created. It's called the best humor. You've got there every, everything, everything. You've got, you've got aliens. You've got um, uh, civilizations on Mars. Uh, uh, you've got Elvis. <laughs> everything and the kitchen sink. I mean, this is... This <laughs> Great. This is huge. Yeah, kitchen sink is very important. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. And uh, th this is incredible. And this is something I've always wanted. There are actually two things I wanted to ask you about this game. First of all, how did you come to this inspiration? I mean, all this huge humor, and we, we have to make a comparison with the humor from the Sierra games. Um, there is also there is always humor in the Sierra games, especially in the Space Quest series or in the Laris. But those are extreme self-sarcasm or sarcasm. The humor in this game, in, in Jack McCraggan, it's actual humor. It's not sarcasm. It's not humiliating the, uh, the protagonist. This is, a, this is an incredible inspiration. How, how did you get to that? Well, the, I mean, I've always been interested in new age 
type stuff, you know, thing. I mean, even as a kid, I would read books about, you know, psychic phenomena and reincarnation and, um, you know, aliens on, you know, visiting the, the earth and all that kind of stuff was always really intriguing to me. And so I knew that was going to be the topic overall. And our general manager, Steve Arnold, had a friend up in Seattle area um, named David Spangler, who was um, a famous author, spiritualist, and, you know, that's that was his area. And so he, Steve had me go up and we spent a couple of days, me and David, brainstorming, um, trying to come up with all the you know, looking for everything that would go in that kitchen sink, <laughs> looking for all the different locations on the planet, all the different conspiracy theories, all the different, you know, um, point places of power on the planet and just try to make a, a massive list and then coming up with some ideas of how they could connect. And then I went back, back home to Skywalker ranch um, where my office was at the time. And, just remember going through all the notes and try to figure, trying to figure out how to work this all into into a, a narrative that actually made sense. And um, I remember the first version of my design doc. Um, you know, we pass by tradition we would pass around the our design docs to um, the other game designers and get feedback. And Ron Gilbert felt that it wasn't funny enough, you know, that I hadn't quite hit the level of humor that we should have. So we ended up with a brainstorming session with all the project leaders. And originally, Zach's name was Jason. And he was a reporter, mainstream media reporter, like for like some large newspaper. And just changing it so that instead of working for a newspaper, he's working for a schlocky tabloid that would make up stories and do sensational news it gave us a lot more freedom to be quirky and funny. And just, it was like a little, like a twist, like a 90 degree twist to, to up the, the wackiness of it. And um, the, the original story and everything that was there hadn't changed. It was just kind of taking it from a different point of view. And that's when we actually came up with the name of the game and the name of the character. And we used a, a Marin County phone book and looked at different names and just kind of picked a Zach, Zachary, Zach in the McCracken. And, and that, that's where it came from. Um, so part of the humor was me. Part of it, is, I mean, that's my humor. That's how I, I am. And part of it was um, Matthew Kane, Matthew Allen Kane, who um, came in to help code it with me. <clears throat> he was already working in a, in the learning group adjacent to our games group. And he switched over and he did all the music. He's also a musician and composer. And he co-scripted the game with me. And so it was, and fortunately he has a very similar sense of humor. And we, I think we would kind of bounce things off each other and just try to ramp it up and, and add things where we saw things that could be funnier and it just worked, you know, at this point, I, I have a hard time knowing which part was mine, which part was his. It just kind of melded together since we both edited each other's work. Okay. Um, this, is a, this is a great game. Uh, this is a huge game. Um, and obviously, it's got a cult following, even um, going all the way to develop uh, some sequels to the game. Um, uh, are you familiar with the sequel that were created by fans, like Between Time and Space? I'm aware of them, but I never played them. Um, so I felt um, I was blown away when I found out that people were actually doing sequels on this game. And But I realized like I probably shouldn't look at them <clears throat> just in case there was a if there ever were a, an official sequel, I didn't want ever to have to worry about whether I accidentally stole an idea from one of the other fan base sequels. So I, I, to this date, I still haven't played them. <clears throat> um, now, 
I don't know if this is going to affect any future interviews with other Lucasfilm, uh, LucasArts developers, but um, from all the games of LucasArts, and uh, I must say that I love every single adventure ever created by that studio, um, Jacques McCracken is by far, by far my favorite. And Loom is the second favorite. <laughs> uh, now, moving to another game, um, Usually when we have games based on movies or vice versa, they end in disaster. And yeah, E.T. Comes, always comes to mind. <laughs> but in your case, you managed to get one of the most recognizable characters of movies and turn that into a really incredible game. And of course, we're talking about Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. What an amazing game that was. Um, may, may I ask, weren't you scared that, um, because you, you followed, you, you quite followed the script, you quite followed, and yet you created an original game that was very engaging. Weren't you scared that mm, things are not very restricted when you have to follow a specific script? Um. I don't think that was the worry. I think the big worry was, can we get it done in time? And <clears throat> originally, um, Noah Faustine was was working on the game for like maybe a month. And then we realized that in order to pull it off, first of all, doing it as a graphic adventure using Scum again, since this would be the third game, um, we, we already had a, a mature environment that we could jump in and use rather than having to build something from scratch. So that dictated the kind of game it would be if we if we did a graphic venture using Scum system. Um, and then Ron Gilbert and I were both brought in and we all pretty much co-project led and co-designed the game. And Ron and I did most of the coding. And we basically looked through the script. We had a script. We had um, stills or photographs from from the set, um, so production stills. And we had a brief meeting with um, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, where we just basically asked them, can we, can we kill Indy? Can we deviate from the, the movie? How far off this, the movie script could we go? And we pretty, make, pretty much got full creative control to do whatever we wanted to, as long as we made it still feel like Indiana Jones. And, you know, this is the third movie. We already seen two movies with, with Indiana Jones in it. Um, and we read the script of the third. So we felt like we knew the character pretty well. And we had the environments. We didn't have to come up with very many original environments. And uh, it was really, how do we, how do we do the puzzles in a way where, Again, like with Labyrinth, where having seen the movie doesn't give you a, a major advantage and that you aren't expected to. Although we probably assume most people will have seen the movie by the time they played it, that's actually not the case. I mean, I hear from people all the time that that this was their first exposure to the, the story was the game. Um, so you know, we we knew we had about six months to eight months to actually pull it off. So it was really finding the key scenes, finding how to interact. Um, I think one thing that was really different with this game was the idea that you could you pretty much find alternate solutions, um, either talking your way out with a dialogue tree or giving something or fighting. Um, and here I see in the video, you, this is the place where you could learn how to use your punching. That was you know something which we, didn't especially want to do, but we felt like because India is such an action type movie, you needed to have some kind of action in it. So this was our our one nod to an action experience in a game. I don't know how well we pulled it off. I, I never liked doing it myself when I tested. So I think we had a special button as programmers where we could just push a special button and it would knock out the character with one hit so we can get through the game really fast. Um, but I feel like we did a pretty good balance. I mean, between the three of us, both brainstorming and, and trying to be realistic about what we could pull off, 
Um, I think a lot of games go off the rails because the one person in charge might have ideas that they aren't willing to give up. Uh, they get too attached to, and then it gets starts growing and growing and growing. Where here we all kind of held each other in check and also, you know, had great meetings with lots of creativity. We already knew each other really well. So that was a, a good team to work on this. Um, so it worked. Um, we actually went to LA to Los Angeles, um, maybe a month or so before the film released and saw a screening of it and realized that there were, there was at least one scene in the game, which had been cut from the movie that you know, we pulled from the script. And so there were things that we, we included that weren't in the game, weren't in the movie actually. Like there's a whole sequence with the radio operator in the Zeppelin, which, um, was originally in the script, which got cut. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes much more sense if you knew about that scene when the Zeppelin starts turning around in the movie and Indy says something like, well, it looks like they must have fixed that radio sooner than we thought. And, and you're thinking in the movie, what radio were they talking about? And if you play the game, you know what they're talking about. So it's kind of fun. Um, to but this, this is incredible what you managed to do in six months based on what you had. And yeah, you well, it, it did take us, it, we did go over a little bit. I think I think we finished maybe eight months after we started. So at least a little late. But Indy, Indy was a was in the theaters for such a long time that that wasn't as critical. It was terrible. Um, and um, the, the humor is there. You mean you managed to capture the humor on, on previous games, but also the humor that uh, Indiana Jones, they, they, I mean, they have a lot of humorous moments. Mm -hmm. I remember it, it was one of the many LucasArts games I managed to finish. And okay. it's not very punishing, I mean, not compared to Sierra games. <laughs> I feel I go back there. <laughs> yeah. there, um, there, is, there is a place at the end where um, the end game sequence where both Ron and Noah had been working on dialogue and I was implementing it. And I got, first I got Ron's dialogue, which was really irreverent and tongue in cheek. And then I got Noah's, which was much more serious and closer to the, the way the movie was. And they both, I thought that Ron's was a placeholder and it turned out he in, intended it to be actually what was used. So I ended up, um, they both wanted theirs to be the one we use. So I ended up doing oh. random number um, a choice to choose which one to use. It. So if you play the game multiple times, you might get different dialogue at the end in the end sequence, like around the time of the earthquake. Um, may I ask, um, the, the games, LucasArts games, um, they, you, you chose for your characters not to die. Um, when I asked the same thing about uh, from, Byron, from when I asked the same thing to Berta Williams, she said, "In real life, when you make mistakes, you pay the price. I mean, if you fall down a cliff, you die." Uh, how did you decide that uh, there there is no almost no death in the in your games? Well, we did have death actually. Well, you can die in Maniac Mansion. Zach could actually die. Indy could die. I mean, there, there. I think the first game where we didn't do that was probably in well, in Loom and then Monkey Island, where it was much more intentional. What I think was more critical was the idea that you that there weren't random deaths, there weren't um, arbitrary deaths. The idea that if you did something, if you jumped out of an airplane without a parachute, um, you probably would die if you actually could do that. Um, but picking like the, when I keep on thinking about in Sierra was the idea that remember there being a, a, a broken mirror. Uh -huh. And if you pick up a piece of glass from the broken mirror, you cut yourself and you die. And I said, well, this, this is mean spirited and arbitrary. And it felt like the programmer was finding ways to interrupt the story with a death to elongate the gameplay. And it didn't feel like they were 
supporting me as a player, that like they were actually working against me as a player. So I think our philosophy was we want the players to have fun, to have the aha experiences. Um, having a barrier isn't bad as long as it's telegraphed ahead of time so that you know that this this thing is likely to kill you or be dangerous. Uh, better save your game now because something doing this might be bad. Um, rather than just doing a random thing you do in everyday life and survive, um, we want to make sure that it was very clear that you would, if you did have to die, that you you know that you were prepared for it. Mm-hmm. So we weren't working against the player. So it was kind of this. I felt like there was a level of sadism almost in some of the Sierra games in in working against the player, and that was something we weren't doing. All right. Um, coming up to more recent years, it was a great joy a few years back when we read about an upcoming game called Thimbleweed Park. And Hello everybody recognized the style quite similar to the X-Files <laughs> that we uh, used to watch the, <laughs> a couple of decades back. Uh, and it was really joy to see that you, the, the Thimbleweed Park, it really resembled the humor and the graphics of a previous game. Uh, so, um, may, may I May I suppose that this is closer to, let's say, the Maniac Mansion kind of style than any other graphic game, or am I wrong in this? No, it was, and that was intentional. Um, I mean, this is a Kickstarter. Um, Ron and Gary had gotten together and decided they would they do a game, and they did it as a Kickstarter. Um, and the the idea was the the line they used in the Kickstarter campaign was like, imagine you open your drawer and you find a, an old floppy disc from 1988 of a Lucas Lucasfilm game that you'd never played before. And that's what we were going to give you. Um, So the original art style was much rougher. It was more maniac mansion. And then we, when we started getting more and more money, um, way over our original ask. Um, that's when I got brought on, and it's also when Mark Ferrari got brought on. And with Mark Ferrari as the background artist, that you know changed the look to be much more you know rich and and you know I'd say much more like early '90s than late '80s in terms of the stuff because we had a full color palette. Um, and uh, but the the idea was we still wanted to do a point and click and to do a verb interface that so to make it feel like it was like late eighties style. Um, so I think we did that. Um, you know, the the intent was to find all the people who loved our old games and get them to back it. <laughs> so we built the game for for that audience. Um, I've been playing this game with my son. He's now 16 on our PlayStation. And uh, the, the humor is there. And this is much more, much, much easier for uh, today's generation to get into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I recognize everything. I mean, the DNA of Maniac Mansion and Jacques McCracken is there. And uh, the, la- the larger sprites, I mean, this is a signature Jacques McCracken and Maniac Mansion. Uh, the the change between the characters during scenes. Um, this is an this is an amazing inspiration you've got, and really really thank you for bringing this game out. Yeah. Um, now the the next game I'm going to move. It went to another direction artistically, uh, and uh, personally I love it. But uh, some of the fans didn't. And of course, I'm talking about uh, Return to Monkey Island, which is a bold move that we loved. Personally, I loved the style. I loved what we did with the game. Uh, How did it feel to return to one of the most iconic graphic adventure games of all time? Um, well, I, I see so during the, when the first Monkey Island game was being made, I was then the director of operations at Lucasfilm Games slash LucasArts. I think we just were switching to LucasArts is the name. And I um, didn't get to 
I mean, I, I, I love the game. This is actually one of my, the first two Monkey Islands were, were two of my, really my, my favorite two games that I've played before up until maybe up until now. And um, I'm sure I was a little bit jealous. You know, I was stuck doing management when I could have been doing creative work. And I really had wished I could have been on those projects. I, I remember brainstorming in one meeting uh, for the first Monkey Island game. That was pretty much my involvement. I, I did helped play test. Um, we had these pizza nights where we would all get together in the evening with pizza and Ron would have us play through different sections of the games and get reactions and see how maybe 10 or 15 of us would play these, these play on the computers and we get to see how it felt and you get to watch us. Um, so I was blown away when I found out what Ron was going to be working on for the next game and was really excited to be invited to join. Um, very different than the other games in that um, I was much more, my role was as lead game programmer um, and much less involved in any of the design. Um, or Thimbleweed Park, um, the original story was Gary and Ron, but for all the brainstorming for actually how to implement the puzzles, that was all three of us. And then also Jen participated, Jen, um, Ron's wife, who's our producer on Monkey Island. Um, we ended up, um, I ended up very much involved in the design of, of Thimbleweed Park, but in, in Monkey Island, it was really Ron Gilbert and Dave Grossman were the two designers. And so I was much more of a implementer, but it was still really fun to work in the in this universe and, and yeah, you know, for the first time, finally actually do it. Um, in terms of the, the look, um, Ron had seen Rex, our, our, our lead artist's design, like maybe 10 years earlier. I think Rex had sent him a picture of how he would imagine Guybrush to look. And Ron loved it. He fell in love with it. And I think it's like the same problem. You fall in love with the, the first version of whatever game it is you play, and that's how you think it, they all should be. So people who play Monkey Island 3 first wanted that to be, you know, the the look and people just kind of get stuck with their expectations what it's supposed to look. But every every <clears throat> single Monkey Island game had a different look. And um reflecting what the tone of the game is, what the what the capabilities were, I'm sure to some degree what the budget was. Um and you know, that's where the, where the, we came with this. I I was surprised the first time I saw the art, I said, whoa. And it took, you know, it took me a couple of weeks to kind of get it. And then once, <clears throat> once I, you know, was with it, living with it for a little bit, that, that seems like the only way it could ever be to me. I mean, this, this seems like, yeah, they finally captured the, the true essence of how Michael Allen should look. So I think people will, you know, there's some people who are stubborn. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people who play the game and say, you know, I didn't like the ga the graphics originally, but now that I've played it in, in motion and it just, it's perfect. So I think we went over most of the people who were, who had objections initially. And, yeah. and even the people who had objections, it was a small, very vocal minority. Um. I think the spirit of uh, Monkey Island is there, and uh, that, that's what's most important because um, always with the, the LucasArts games, it wasn't about the graphics as such, but it was about the humor, the, the story, the twists, <laughs> the, the, everything about them. So this is 100% a Monkey Island game. Mm -hmm. And personally, I am very glad that you did Thimbleweed Park um, as an ode to the past, which brought us uh, uh, back to the days where we used to play on um, 16 color monitors um, with Jack McCracken and the first LucasArts game. But now we've got another Monkey Island, which is a real Monkey Island game with the new graphics, which we also like. So yeah, I'm guessing if we hadn't done Thimbleweed Park, it would have been it's possible Monkey Island might have been more throw, you know, look more like the old style. 
Um, but we kind of did that, so we didn't have to do that again. You know, we could we could do whatever we, whatever we wanted to. There, there's, there is. Um, I know people know about. There was a game called Dolores that we did um, right yeah. during the during the lockdown for COVID um, in March April of 2020. Ron had already started working on Monkey Island. I didn't know what the game was, but he he was working on a new engine based on, you know, evolving from the Thimbleweed Park engine, but different. And he wanted to try out some user interface things. So he and I <clears throat> did this game called Dolores, which reused the art assets from Thimbleweed Park and did a like a mini graphic adventure that was a freebie. It was a throw, you know, people, we gave it to everyone as a free download. Then Ron actually released the game code, um, not the engine, but the the scripting code um, on GitHub that people could download if they want to play with it and look at it. And that was the early version of the same dinky graph, you know, game engine that we used for um, Return of Monkey Island. So that was... So I was actually working on an early version of it before I knew what it was. You know, it wasn't for another few months before Ron was able to tell me about the new game. Um, all this, um, all this about the games, how how you started, how the games you created evolved, and of course how you managed to raise an entire generation of people who were uh, really into your games and inspired by your games. Uh, one of the posts on our website today uh, promoting this interview was by a person who said that um, your games inspired him um, to get more involved with computers and programming. And I could say the same thing. I mean, uh, when I played my first adventure game, King's Quest II, and it was, wow, I was really amazed. And I said, this is the type of game I, I want to play. And of course, then I met Jack McCraggan. And... Uh, as a school teacher, because I'm a school I'm a primary school teacher, that's my main job. I always implement stories from games and even video games with my students because they're not only very good in understanding the logic of puzzles and solving puzzles, but it's also amazing when we try to get students engaged in creating their own plots, their own games. Uh, so bottom line, you not only inspired me personally, but you inspired whole generation of people who are now into video game making because of your games. Uh, I, I, I don't really think that you could actually predict that when you started creating games. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm always honored when I hear someone say something like that, that, you know, that I was the reason they got the games or, you know, there someone told me that Zach McCracken um, inspired him to become a astrophysicist. Mm -hmm. And he ended up working in Germany, working on a component of the um, Hubble telescope. Um, and no, is that, no, the what, what was the new one that just launched? Is that the, that was the, you know, the, the big telescope that just launched. And he was he worked on a component for that one because of Zach. And, um, you know, it's like hearing the, someone else became an archaeologist because of Zach. And so hearing that something that I created ended up inspiring someone to, you know, launching them onto their profession was like, whoa, it was definitely not something I expected. Um, and that's very cool. I, I mean, I didn't think we didn't think that these games would still be known uh, more than a couple years after we released them. Um, we figured, you know, you do a game for Commodore 64, and you know, after a few years, people would throw away their Commodore 64s and get some other computer, and that'd be the end of those games. So we just didn't think about emulators and the fact that you had something like Scum VM or something which would allow you to play it on modern machines. So that was that blew me away when we first learned that. Well, the, the thing is uh, that um, you are the people who created the core engines, the core, let's say, rules. Uh, all these games that we have, and, and over the years, we, we saw releases of some incredible 
adventure games from other companies. Um, Sanitarium comes to mind. The Longest Journey comes to mind, which was some probably the longest journey to me. It's one of the greatest graphic adventure games ever released. But these guys, they had it easy because you were there first. Roberta Williams was there first. You were there first with the actual point and click adventure. So you set the pace, you set the rules, you showed what it works. So the other guys, they had it easy. They really had it easy because of you. So this was amazing. I mean, well, we, we all build on other people's creative works too. I mean, like, you know, we were inspired by graphic ventures from Sierra and all of us went back to like the text adventures from, um, you know, from Infocom, Infocom and also, you know, the, the adventure game, the original one, the text went from the, from the seventies or sixties. So, um, you know, you find thing parts of it you like, and you figure out how you how you adapt it to current technology, and expand it, and then put your stuff on top. So, and and we were all inspired by movies, also. Um, you know, how do you get storytelling in there in a way where it, you're where it feels natural, and you're but you're more involved. So, but yes, I I feel like we're all kind of contributing to the whole body of work of all this. Yeah. Um, I, I think people are anxious to ask questions. So because I also, we only have 15 minutes. Um, Mr. David Fox uh, has asked that uh, we finish at a uh, quarter past eight our time. So we have 15 minutes for questions. Um, yeah, there there is a question on the text about the F and yeah, that's that's actually the the F and Tom's version of Zach. Um, it was higher quality, so it bet, better looking on the screens. Uh, but it was also now, uh, Mister Panagiotis Haralambus, uh, Mister Haralambus, I think uh, you can open your microphone. Yes, um, you should be able to talk. I mean, you don't have restrictions. Um, try now, please, Mr. Haralambus. Um, what about now? Ah, yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, technology. <laughs> so, uh, hi, Mr. Fox. Uh, my name is uh, Panayoris, and I'm I'm, uh, I'm 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 a researcher. I do computer uh, graphics and animation as my main uh, uh, research. And actually, you mentioned SIGGRAPH before. I'm currently reviewing papers for SIGGRAPH. I have a deadline in an hour, but you know, this is more important, I think. So uh, I would like to thank you for a lot of things, actually. Uh, when I was young, actually the first games I ever bought by myself were Zach McCracken and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Mm -hmm. And I remember my father taking me to Micromania for, mm -hmm. from Cyprus. And I, I remember I bought those two. I didn't know why, but I never... Uh, regret the, that decision. So thank you for these games. They actually inspired me to do, uh, to study computer science, to be honest. I was never a very good game programmer, but at least I I followed uh, the, the computer animation uh, part of that. And now that I saw yeah, that you also have a book, I'm gonna buy the book because I I enjoy these books a lot. Well, that, that book is actually, um, it's not in print, but there's a, someone scanned it and the entire book is free online. Um, just you know, search for it. I think it's on the Atari Archive website. Yeah, it's there. Um, I, I googled it already. <laughs> yeah, so it's all it's all been scanned. Um, feel free to to read it. I think they're also the the um, someone digitized or, or gra uploaded the sample programs from the book, and I think those are downloadable um, through some of the Atari emulator websites. So you could actually look at the code if you have basic. Um, they're all done written in basic. Basic. Okay, that's cool. 
so um and i'm also yeah i'm also a backer of thimbleweed park also so thank you for that also <laughs> Um, so, so you you talked a lot about uh, Ron Gilbert in your uh, in your interview today. So I was wondering about your relationship with uh, Ron Gilbert and uh, the newest engine that you developed for um, Thimbleweed Park, and as far as I understand, also for Escape uh, from Monkey Island. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about. Uh, that engine and if you plan to use it for other games maybe well so that was a return to monkey island rather than escape uh, return um, yeah sorry I yeah um we, well ron ron created the engine um i i'm not a coder on that level so i all did i just did the front end stuff um so using the coding language which then you know his engine supported basically um i hope that he does another game that uses it because it's a really cool engine i really like playing with um the language it's very powerful but um nothing nothing in the works at this point um if there was i probably couldn't say but there isn't so um i think we're all still um unwinding from the intensity of of Return to Monkey Island. I'm taking a nice break, and then who knows what will be next. I'm I'm also working on. Um, I did a game nine years ago called Rube Rube Works, based on Rube Goldberg's cartoons, which is out for. It's on Steam, and it's also on iOS and Android. But I started working on a VR version of that, so I kind of am going back in and trying to do that again. And um, and just you know taking it easy. Um, I, I just got an electric bike, so I'm going to do some more outside activity when the weather gets better. Um, mm -hmm. But it's nice to I me. Mean, my normal mode was you know work three or four or five hours and then do other stuff. Um, during the Monkey Island period, it was a solid eight hours a day, five days a week, which was great. We weren't doing overtime. But it's very intense because you're it's like a really intense eight hours of coding. And um, I'm enjoying the break still. So I would let Andreas to continue and maybe I can ask later. Yeah. yeah. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, hello, Mr. Fox, and thanks for uh, arranging this call, I think, for all of us that grew up in the late 80s and early 90s uh, and playing video games, it's 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 a huge thing, you know, having you here talk, uh, talking about those days. Personally, I'm a, I'm a writer and uh, a filmmaker, I'm a director, and uh, your games, all the LucasArts games, were a huge influence <laughs> on my work up to today, uh, actually. So vice versa, you know, from video games going to movies, you know, you can also get uh, that, that inspiration. Um, so I wanted to ask, um, uh, what was George Lucas' involvement during those days at LucasArts? I mean, uh, did he ever, you know, uh, came into the office? Did he play the games? Did he have uh, feedback? Uh, how was the creative uh, cooperation with him? Um, he was mostly uninvolved. Um, the only games that I know of that he actually sat down and played prior to release were Rescue on Fractalus and Ball Blazer. And that was because we were brand new, um, like maybe a year, year in, he came into my office and played the game for about 20 minutes and gave me some really great feedback. And some of the key things from Rescue were based on an idea that he had. So the idea of the, um, the monster popping up, which he probably saw in that video it was shown earlier. Um, and, he, he was looking at it for a way to increase the tension and th absolutely did that. I think it was the game is the, really the first game that had a jump scare. And um, I have to credit George for that. He also, um, originally the game was much more, um, was intended to be a nonviolent game. You were just supposed to be going down and picking up pilots and rescuing them. You weren't supposed to be shooting. And he insisted on adding a fire button to shoot stuff. 
So um, he was right about that too. <laughs> it made the game a lot better. So that was it. Then after that, he, he I mean, he was really never a game player. So he just wasn't um, all that involved. And he might have been behind the scenes that I didn't know about. I think once or twice he might have played a game after it was pretty much done. So he wasn't giving feedback. Um, I know that Steven Spielberg was much more of a game player. So especially for um, some of our flight simulators, for indie and for for the indie games, he actually would play them all the way through with his son. He would call us up for hints. <laughs> and um, I never got one of the phone calls, but I think both um, Ron and Noah got phone calls from him. It's like, yeah, here I am stuck in the catacombs. How do I get out or whatever? And um, that was kind of fun. Uh, if I can do, can I do a follow-up question? Do we have the time? Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, okay, just a final question for me. If there was ever uh, a game that you wanted to develop, to design, and you never did, what was that game? I mean, mm. uh, during the LucasArts uh, years. Well, when I first joined, what I really wanted to be doing was more location-based entertainment, so theme park level inter interactivity. And th so it was, wasn't a specific game on a computer. It was more the kind of game. Um, and the last two years I was at the company, I got to work on a project like that, which was fa fantastic. It was actually a Star Wars based game. It was using flight simulator technology, a professional million dollar level image generators and multiplayer. And we were doing it in, uh, in partnership with Hughes simulations, Hughes aircraft. And they were doing all the hardware tech and we were doing the game design and the software, some of the software. And um, unfortunately it was just too expensive for that for 1991, 92 period um, and went away and the project stopped. So if I had any choice, it would have been to have that project continue and end up, you know, ending up in theme parks and doing multiple games like that. Now, oh, if there are no more questions, um, just one thing I'd like to ask. Uh, <laughs> this is a joke, actually. <laughs> I, I always wanted to ask you about uh, Jacques McCracken. The second question, those poor co-eds that launched from Mars, if I ever left my Atari ST on for two or three years, would they ever land? <laughs> <laughs> Well, in, I think in the in the story they did land, but there wasn't any code in the game to have them do it. Uh, okay. So I think I think am I right that in the epilogue text that shows up over the end game, I think I refer to them. Um, I don't remember now, but at least in my mind, you know, they they made it safely home and um, they ended up doing cool stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> they uh, that you didn't have to leave your computer running for them to get home. Yeah. Um, now, to conclude all this, um, Mr. David Fox would like to really thank you. It's been an honor to meet you. Yeah, I just wanted to say where you could find me. Um, I'm on, um, I have a, a Twitter account, which I am pretty much not using now. Um, I'm on Mastodon and... I'm also on some of the newer social media sites, post.news and um, spoutable.com. And um, I'm still on Facebook, but you know, I'm sure if you need to reach me, you can find a way. Also through my website, electriceggplant.com. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch uh, because uh, I would really love to uh, have you again in a follow-up interview. And hopefully we'd like to issue, and I think this uh, also reflects everyone's opinion, we would love to see games coming out uh, with your signature on them for years to follow. Thank you very much for giving us an incredible childhood. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. These are, these are my games. These are part of my childhood. Oh, I'll show you this Thank you for this. <laughs> right. From 
from um, oh wow <laughs> that, that's amazing that's a lego and wow you said, this is, it's not lego it's actually um someone okay. someone designed it and printed it if you using a 3d printer <laughs> and printed it. yes this is great this one's also really good wow <laughs> Well, to everyone watching, also it's an Easter egg. If you play Day of the Tentacle, if you go to the bedroom of Eddie, you can switch on his computer and play the entire Maniac Mansion. <laughs> and this one too. Oh, this is the alien, but not Elvis. That's not Elvis. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Fox. Okay. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Bye-bye.